So it's great pleasure to welcome Yop Shea today for our Galford webinar series. He did his PhD at Cambridge and then worked at Princeton for a few years before taking up his position at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And you may uh, already be familiar with some of his work on large scale uh, simulations. He worked on, well, lead, led the OWLS project, which stands for Overwhelmingly Large Simulations, followed up by the EAGLE project, standing for the evolution and assembly of galaxies and their environments. So over to you, Yo. Thank you, Sarah. So, let me put this on full screen for me. For you, it doesn't matter, I guess. Okay, well, it's an honor to be here uh, and a great pleasure. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you in real person, but this is already great. Um, as Sarah said, if, if something is unclear, or you have a question, feel free to interrupt me. So I'll talk about large scale simulations of galaxy evolution. And um, here's an example on, the, on this page of such a large scale simulation. And this is called the Eagle simulation that Sarah mentioned. What is shown here in this uh, top panel is a timeline where time is going from left to right. And the, the height of this, this volume is about 100 megaparsec. This is the size of the Eagle volume. The color coding is the temperature of gas and the intensity is the density of the gas. And in this timeline, I've taken out the expansion of the universe. So this is in co-moving coordinates. And what you can see is that structure develops as time goes on. And that comes out quite naturally when you start a simulation from initial conditions that we can infer from the cosmic microwave background and observations of large scale structure. And if we just put in gravity, hydrodynamics and some prescription for things we cannot resolve like star formation, then we form this large scale structure. And in this large scale structure, we also form galaxies. You can't see them in this top panel because of the scale being 100 megaparsec, but I've, I've put a few uh, post stamps of galaxies that spontaneously form in a simulation like this down there. And you can see we, we have some spiral galaxies on the left and some elliptical galaxies on the right. And there's tens of thousands of galaxies like that in such a simulation. So before saying more about the simulations, I want to make sure we're on the same page and, and very briefly take you through the general picture of uh, structure and galaxy formation that uh, we have in our minds. Um, so we start out with these small uh, primordial fluctuations a very high redshift um, that we want to grow because of gravity always being attractive and therefore we have gravitational instability trying to compress the material into this web of filaments. If you collapse in one dimension, you get a sheet. If you collapse in two dimensions, you get a filament and in three dimensions, you get a, a halo of dark matter. And the gas on these scales up to the filaments basically traces this dark matter. Opposing this collapse is the expansion of the universe, which tries to slow down uh, the gravitational instability. And once we have these concentrations of dark matter and gas, there, there are differences that come into play between the gas and the dark matter. The gas, the baryons are collisional. So when they collide, the particles get accelerated and then they emit light, light and the light can take away energy. And because of that, the gas can compress further than the dark matter can. And that's what we call radiative cooling, even though it can lead to heating, because if the gas compresses, it can actually get hotter. But the thing is, it's still losing energy because it's falling to the minimum of the potential. Um, and that then results in the formation of galaxies because of angular momentum conservation, the, the rotation is, is maintained, angular momentum, and we get the formation of disks typically first. And these fragment into uh, stars, micro clouds and stars and etc. And once these stars form, and sometimes even black holes, but once the stars form, we also have feedback processes. But before getting into that, let me also tell you that this collapse from the dark matter halos, from the gas in the dark matter halos to the more condensed disks is opposed by gas pressure. And that's why we need to, to cool the gas. It needs to lose energy to overcome this pressure barrier. The centrifugal force, which is why we end up with disks. But there can also be, for example, in the case of satellite galaxies moving through, they can be stripped for, from tidal forces or run pressure. And we call a galaxy both this, the disk of stars and gas and black holes, which can later also become a more elliptical configuration. 
and the dark matter around it and the gas gaseous halo around it, all that together we'll call a galaxy. The feedback processes are very, very important. So once the stars form, massive stars, they die in a big explosion called supernova. And before that energy is pumped out into the interstellar medium through radiation and stellar winds. And this, uh, this generates outflows from the galaxy into the, its halo and even from the halo into the intergalactic medium. And that is a critical component of the whole picture. So how can we understand this? Well, there's different types of models that we're using. Um, the, the oldest one is just analytic theory. What is the, the, the accretion rate onto a halo? We can compute this from large scale structure theory. We can compute the cooling rate. We can make some assumptions and come up with a model. Um, more complex models are, or are semi analytic models, the third bullet here, where you build this kind of analytic formalism on top of a merger tree of dark matter halos, um, where the dark matter halos used to be predicted by projector theory, but these days are usually taken from dark matter only simulations. These dark matter only simulations, you can also populate in, in a way that's called semi empirical. There, we don't impose cooling rates and things like that and star formation rates based on physical approximations. You just do it in an empirical way, such a way that you match some observational constraints by construction. The simplest one is called abundance matching. And it, the simplest implementation of that is just, you take the dark matter halo mass function predicted by a dark matter simulation. You rank the halos by mass and then you fill them with an observed luminosity function of galaxies where you put the brightest galaxy in the most massive dark halo and you go down. And you can do more complex things than that, which can also then match additional constraints like clustering. And the most complex way to model this is hydrodynamical simulations, where we do not just the dark matter, but also the baryons. We still need some semi-analytic prescriptions or semi-empirical prescriptions for things that are below the resolution limit. And those are called subgrid models. Cosmological hydrodynamical simulations. So we start from high redshift and what, what is high depends on what your goal is, but typically a redshift higher than hundred when the fluctuations are still small. And cosmological refers to that we start not only from high redshift, but we also take a large volume much bigger than the scale of interest, so that it's representative. Then the expansion is solved analytically and scaled out. So we use co-moving coordinates. The initial conditions these days are quite well known from the cosmic microwave background and large scale structure observations. Uh, for, the, for the purpose of galaxy formation, they're not such a limiting factor anymore, the uncertainty in the initial conditions. We're still quite interested in, in them because we also want to go back sometimes and from the, uh, um, the observations and the predictions of these simulations try to reconstruct the initial conditions. The boundary conditions that we use are periodic, and that's why we use cubic volumes, because we want the, the volume to be representative, periodic is appropriate, and doing using those boundary conditions prevents edge effects at the edge of the box. Then what we put in in a standard, uh, at least in a Lambda CDM uh, simulation is cold dark matter, gas, so it's just the baryons, and stars. Well, the, in the cosmological simulations, they're not put in from the start. They are formed from the gas, and radiation is then emitted by the gas. And uh, in these simulations I show you, we assume the gas to be optically thin to ionizing radiation, at least. Then we need to discretize something. So the time is always discretized. So we have a snapshot of the situation of the simulation at one time. And then we solve the differential equations and predict how it evolves over some finite time step and then repeat. Then you have to make a choice whether you discretize mass, which is what we do in smooth particle hydrodynamics, SPH. And that's the simulations I'll show you use that technique. But you can also discretize length to make cells. And uh, you can make those cells also varying in size. And then you would have adaptive mesh refinement, AMR. And then you need solvers for the gravitational force, for the gas pressures. And in some simulations, you may also want to do magnetohydrodynamics or radiative transfer. And finally, very important, we need subgrid modules. So and for the things that are not directly resolved. And why do we need those? 
and that it's because there's just such a large range of length and time scales that are important. And I've summarized them here. So starting from the observable universe on the bottom, which is about 10 to the 28 centimeters, going down in scales, clusters of galaxies are about a megaparsec in size, galaxy halos, tens of kiloparsecs, star clusters, and we're talking about 100 parsecs, the distance between stars is about a parsec, jumping to stellar radii uh, is another seven orders of magnitude. But we even care about the distances between atomic particles because those determine how often they collide and what kind of radiation they emit. In fact, we even care about the distances of particles in stars because nucleosynthesis happens in stars. And that determines what is output in, by the star in terms of energy and chemical elements. So some of this you can do directly. Modern simulations can do about five to six orders of magnitudes in length scale directly, but the rest has to be subgrid. So where you want to go from subgrid to explicit simulation depends on what you want to do. If you want to have a very large volume of a gigaparsec, you probably will go to subgrid at about 10 kiloparsec scale. But you can also choose to do the subgrid scale at a few parsecs and then only simulate the volume of about a megaparsec. What are these subgrid models? Well, these are the most common ones. Uh, one, as I already mentioned, radiative cooling and heating. So that's just a prescription for how much energy is emitted by the gas as a function of its properties, which is typically the density, the temperature, the chemical composition, and perhaps also the radiation field that is shining on it. Above some density that we can still resolve, we have to say that stars are being formed with some efficiency. So we can't, in these cosmological simulations, follow the star, the, the formation of individual stars themselves. So we typically form star particles, which may represent thousands to millions of solar masses of stars. So they're basically stellar populations. Then once these stars are formed, these stellar populations are formed, they lose mass through evolution. So there's um, uh, AGB stars that drive winds, there are supernova explosions of different types, and these release elements, heavy elements, back into the interstellar medium. And that's something we need to follow because those heavy elements, for example, change how the uh, gas is emitting radiation. So it changes the cooling losses. And it also gives us information about the history of star formation. The young stars, they put in energy and that can drive galactic winds and that those winds are important because they remove fuel from star formation. Black holes can also form, both small ones, but I'm particularly, uh, for the simulation, we're particularly interested in the nuclear ones, the supermassive ones, that can have masses up to uh, 100 million solar masses. So to we, we need some prescription to decide when they form and after they formed, how much gas they accrete and how they merge with other black holes and also um, how they inject energy back into the interstellar medium and the intergalactic medium through what we call AGN, active galactic nuclei feedback. The process that's not very well understood, but this can include jets, but it can also include winds from accretion disks, for example. Uh, people have been trying to do, to do galaxy formation and hydrodynamical simulation for a long time, for decades. And until about you know, five to 10 years ago, um, this was not very successful. The large scale simulations could not form, and even the small scale simulations could not form realistic galaxies. The galaxies tended to be too massive, too small, form at very high redshift, and we have essentially no disks. Now that changed in the last uh, decade or so, first using zoom simulations of individual objects, and then even in large scale simulations. And that was thanks to a few things. The main thing it was th thanks to was not so much that computers got faster or the software got faster. It was mainly because people got smarter about the subgrid physics. Because of uh, the finite resolution that any simulation will always have, um, it turns out that it's difficult to do feedback properly. Um, basically what happens is you, you have to give the energy to a resolution element and if the resolution element represents a large amount of mass, then the energy that you get from star formation or black holes cannot heat the gas up very much. If it heats it up only a little bit, then radiative losses are very important because the cooling function 
uh, the cooling rate is higher if the temperature is a bit lower. And that then results in a catastrophic loss of feedback energy and in a, and a too efficient galaxy formation. So that was very important to change that. And to change that, you have to make some ad hoc approximations and different groups are doing different things in that respect. The other thing that changed, and this is relevant for the high mass uh, galaxy formation, is that people put in supermassive black holes and the associated AGN feedback. So there's a few uh, initial things we need to consider when we, we're thinking about high dynamical simulations of galaxy formation. Um, one is that we need these strong outflows. They are observed. And if we don't put them in the simulations, if we don't have the strong feedback, then star formation is too efficient. We get too massive and too old galaxies. Another thing is that if you plot from an observational perspective, the efficiency of galaxy formation, and this can be done in various ways, but one way is this abundance matching that I told you about, and you get this kind of graph. What is shown here on the x-axis is the mass of the halo. So this is dominated by dark matter. And on the y-axis is a galaxy formation efficiency parameter. What I've shown there is the ratio of the stellar mass of the central galaxy to its halo mass divided by the universal baryon fraction. So if the baryons traced the dark matter on halo scales and all the baryons were converted into stars, then this y-axis value would be one. It's a log, so it would be zero to be at the top of this panel. And what you can see is that as you go from very low halo masses of 10 to the 10 up, that these curves, and you should look at the uh, these gray and black curves, so that's what from abundance matching uh, a constraint, what we think the observed universe is doing. Galaxy formation gets more efficient. A bigger fraction of the baryons are converted into stars. But even at its peak, it's still an inefficient process. It's still only about 10% of order 10%. And it peaks at a halo mass of about 10 to the 12 solar masses, which is similar to the halo mass of our Milky Way galaxy. But then if you go to even higher masses, it gets more inefficient again. Now that's interesting that there is a peak value. Um, it, it, it basically, well, let me first tell you that it basically tells you that there's two kinds of feedback that you need. Because it's difficult to think of one feedback process that first becomes more efficient and then again, or first gets less efficient and then again gets more efficient as you go to higher mass. So what we think is that at the low mass end it's mostly stellar feedback and at the high mass end it's mostly black hole feedback, AGM feedback. Now where we are in this plot is difficult to predict from first principles. The colored lines are different simulations from the Eagle project, but they have been calibrated to give a rough match to this. It's difficult to do this uh, from first principle because in these large scale simulations, we do not resolve the structure of the interstellar medium. In particular, we don't have any molecules or cold gas. And because of that, it's difficult to predict how much the gas will radiate because we have the wrong density distribution. And it's difficult to predict how many supernova bubbles will collide with, with each other. So this efficiency of converting the energy from supernovae and radiation into galactic scale outflows has some uncertainty. And that's essentially a free parameter of these subgrid models. And that's determined, that's set to match roughly this, uh, this previous plot or the galaxy mass function is another way to do it. So you need some calibration because of these uncertainties. Um, and that is always true for any of these simulations. Uh, it's then important to decide what observations you calibrate to because that's the no longer a prediction. And it's also very important to make it clear to everyone that you've done that. And this was uh, something that took theorists a while to get used to, because as physicists, we like to predict everything and giving up something as big as the mass of a galaxy, essentially the stellar mass as a predict, something you can predict was a bit painful. The same is true for the black hole masses. We cannot predict those from first principles too, because we don't know the efficiency of the AGN feedback. So galaxy formation, because of that is not fundamental theory and it's generally better for qualitative than quantitative prediction. Um, this model calibration is not just a matter of changing parameters in subject uh, uh, modules. So some, some computational um, astrophysicists who do galaxy formation may tell you we didn't calibrate our models. But what they then usually mean is that they didn't try to 
fine tune these free parameters. And these parameters are not completely free, of course. If we don't tune them, we don't get things wrong by an order of magnitude. We get things wrong by a factor of a few. But the calibration is not just these free parameters, it's also how you do things. For example, if we put the energy from young stars into the nearest resolution element or we distribute it isotropically, these are choices. And a choice like that can change things by a factor of a few. So there's many things under the hood that are changed from one generation of simulations to another one that are effectively calibration and that people don't tend to talk about. And another aspect of that is that uh, because if you go to a higher resolution, you resolve a bit more of the relevant physics, you generally need to adjust some of the parameters or prescriptions to maintain agreement with data. So these simulations, the cosmological simulations come in two kinds of, of types. The, you can zoom in to a, a particular object, an individual galaxy or cluster of galaxies and have very high resolution. Or you can do a large volume um, where you do basically every galaxy with a similar resolution. And they all have their own advantages. So if you zoom in, you have you can maximize the resolution that you have for a particular galaxy and you can do a very large range of, of uh, galaxy masses. You can do a zoom of a tiny dwarf galaxy that has much higher resolution than a zoom of a cluster of galaxies, for example. The advantage of the big volumes that use uniform resolution is that um, you have the same resolution for low and high mass objects. So you have the same model because if you change the resolution, you change the model. Um, you have very good statistics, so you can look for scaling relations, scatter and scaling relations. You can look for the effective environment. Uh, you can mimic observational selection and therefore compare more straightforwardly to observations. And also you have high resolution, not just on the galaxies, but also the gas around them. So they're very complementary techniques. Here's just some pictures of some zoom simulations of the last few years um, of different collaborations. Where the, the two on the left, Hydrangi and Apostle, are zoom simulations that use the Eagle model. So they're from the Eagle simulation that I'll talk about. But Apostle zooms in to local group galaxies environments, and Hydrangi zooms into clusters. Besides Eagle, there's also many other uh, groups that are doing these kinds of simulations now. Uh, Alastus TNG is, is one, Horizon is another one. There's also one that has a, a strong South African link. <clears throat> which is called uh, Simba, but they don't have a picture on their website yet. So I, I uh, couldn't uh, put that in. And before that, that was Mufasa. Here's a, a little short video of the evolution in the Eagle simulation. On the left, the color coding is temperature and on the right, it's metallicity. And this is, we're going already, this was the entire history of the universe that we've already passed now. So I did this really quickly. I don't know how well this is visible in the Zoom presentation. I'm going to show it once more. The advantage of doing it so quickly is that you can see how violent it is. That these they really look like explosions now that you're seeing. And the, the big things you're seeing, the scale here is 25 megaparsec, by the way. The big things are mostly driven by the AGN. The ones uh, the outflows driven by star formation are a bit smaller and difficult to see on the scale. All right. Um, so let me take a look at the time, see if I want to go into this much detail. I think I'll skip this. This is some difference between two simulations. If you're interested in this, you can look back at this slide later. It summarizes the different choices that you can make in terms of the main subject physics and what you calibrate to, where in TNG they're making quite different choices than in Eagle uh, and have more observables that are calibrated to. The interesting thing is that these two simulations, and the same is true for some other simulations, that they both reproduce the galaxy mass function by calibration, but change, they differ quite dramatically in their predictions for things that are not calibrated on and that are not well observed. And here's one example of this. So it is shown here on the x-axis is again halo mass. On the y-axis is a fraction of the, the baryonic content um, of the, the halo that is still there. So if there was never any ejection, never any feedback, you would expect that the baryon fraction of a halo would be the same as the universal baryon fraction. And what I'm showing here is a ratio of the mass fraction that's in a circumgalactic medium 
to the universal Baron fraction. So I, I sorry, I'm saying this a bit in a confused way. So it's not the Baron fraction of the halo, it's the fraction of mass in a certain black medium. The galaxy itself has been excluded. How much gas is in there relative to the universal Baron fraction? And what you can see is that eagle and red and illustrious G and G and blue are qualitatively quite different. So in eagle, the amount of baryons that are in the circumgalactic medium goes up with halo mass. And in T and G, there's a minimum at a mass slightly larger than the Milky Way halo mass. And this minimum in T and G is because their AGN feedback is by hand turned on when the black hole halo mass passes 10 to the eight solar masses, which is about at this uh, scale, at this scale over here, 10 to the 12, and then it's emptied by this feedback. Observationally, we don't really know which of these is more correct. Now, at high mass, this is kind of the uncertainty that we have in the observations. At low mass, there is essentially no observational constraints. They do, however, agree on some other things. So here's again the same plot, but now individual galaxies are shown as points and they have been color coded by the total amount of feedback energy from star formation and AGN combined that has been injected divided by the binding energy of the material. So you would expect that if you dump in more feedback energy relative to the binding energy, that you have less baryons left because then you can blow them out. And that's indeed what you're seeing here. So you can see the blue stuff on top, which has relatively little feedback energy compared to binding energy and the red stuff on the bottom, which are objects where there is a lot of feedback energy compared to binding energy. And that's true in both cases. There's many other qualitative things like that that, uh, that the simulations do agree on. The galactic winds work quite different in these two simulations, and that's shown here. So we can measure the outflow rates of the galactic winds from the galaxies, and that's parameterized here on the y-axis by dividing it by the star formation rate, and that ratio of the outflow rate to the star formation rate is called the mass loading factor of the wind. So plot now is a function of stellar mass, and this is now redshift two, and red is TNG and blue is eagle. If you look at the solid lines, there we measure the outflow rate at 10 kiloparsecs from the galaxy in both cases. And you can see that they have the same kind of mass trend at low mass, but the outflow rates in TNG are a factor of four or five higher than an eagle. If you go to high mass than an eagle, the outflow rate stays the same roughly, but in, in TNG goes up. And that's because of the AGN feedback there. <clears throat> Now, if you go to larger scales, now look at the dotted lines of 50 kiloparsec. There in TNG at low mass, there's almost no outflow left. That's this dotted red line here on the bottom left. So in the TNG simulation, the outflows don't propagate very far. If you look at the blue dotted dot dashed lines, they're almost the same as, it, as the solid lines on low mass. So the whatever is coming out of 10 kpc makes it all the way to 50 kpc. And in fact, at high mass, the outflow rate is larger at 50 kpc than at 10 kpc, which means that a lot of mass is being swept up as the winds propagate through the halo, increasing the mass loading. And you have the same upturn due to AGN feedback. So there's, there's some, some big differences there. Here's another comparison of the mass loading rate as a function of halo mass now at redshift zero with the fire zoom simulations, which show very good agreement in the range of overlap. So this difference between different radii is quite interesting, I think. It's something people don't really look at normally. It's difficult to do observationally. But as shown here on the x-axis, again, halo mass. On the y-axis is the ratio of the mass loading rate of the wind measured at the halo radius, the dark matter halo radius, to the one measured at the galaxy scale. And this is in log. So if this is zero in this plot, then the same stuff that comes out of the halo came out of the galaxy the same amount of matter per unit time. And what you can see here is that as you go to higher redshift or to lower redshift, sorry, from the green to the black line, that this ratio goes up and develops a minimum at about the Milky Way mass. So it's much bigger than one here, which means that a lot more matter is leaving the halo than has left the galaxy. Um, so that is what we call preventative feedback. It stops the, the outflows. They take a lot of gas along with them, with them and they stop the material from accreting. 
So some takeaway points from this, I already said this. Uh, so th there's emerging scaling relations for winds coming out of these simulations and how would they depend on, on star formation rate and galaxy mass, etc. And they're quite different between the different simulations, despite them both giving similar galaxy masses. Um, and now I wanna sh show a few slides of some more, some different results, just taking a look at, my, at the time. Uh, from the Eagle simulation. Uh, you may have seen plots like this before, but this is a census of the baryons in the halos, something we can do with simulations and it's very difficult to do observationally. On the x-axis is halo mass again, on the y-axis is the fraction of the baryonic mass, or, and uh, sorry, the fraction of the total mass. If it was just the baryonic mass and the baryonic mass were universal, then we would be at this dashed line at the top. And what you can see is that the total baronic mass fraction that we measure in the halos by this gray curve uh, shown by the gray curve goes up with mass that's what i've shown before and that high mass is similar to the universal baron fraction but low mass a lot of barons have been lost and we can ask where are they or where are the, the barons that are not lost that are still there i mean well what is in stars is this greenish line green yellowish line so you can see that's actually not a very large fraction of the barons, as we've already seen, a bigger fraction is in the blue curve, which is the circumgalactic medium, the gas within the halo, but outside the galaxy. And a much smaller fraction still is in the interstellar medium, at least a ratio of zero, this is a smaller fraction. And the purple line shows you what is in, in a subset of the circumgalactic medium, the circumgalactic medium with a temperature between 10 to the five and a half and 10 to the seven Kelvin, also called the warm hot intergalactic medium. That's a interesting temperature range because it's difficult to observe. And you can see that that dominates the total baryon census in halos for uh, galaxy masses or for halo mass of about 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 13. But higher masses goes down because then it gets even hotter than 10 to the 7 Kelvin. And that was for the baryons. And what does it look like for metals? For metals, it looks quite different in the sense that stars are much more important. Stars account for the majority of the metals up to about group scale masses. After that, it's again the circumgalactic medium. But the circumgalactic medium is always important for the metals. It's never negligible. It's just a factor of few at most less than the stars. Now, these kind of plots you may have seen before. This plot you probably have never seen before. This is a new plot from a paper that um, a postdoc in Leide, Peter Mitchell is preparing. Now, I've just taken one halo mass and been at around 10 to the 12 solar masses. And what we do is we first look at redshift zero, which is all the way on the right of the plot. And then we look at the mass fractions again in the different components. The CGM is this greenish thing. The interstellar medium is a dark green. The stars is the gray. And everything else that's here in red is stuff that is not in the halo. Right, that was what we also could see in a previous plot. But now what we've do, done is we've traced all the variants as they go in and out of the halo. So then we can see, we can ask the question, what is the mass fraction as a function of time of all the variants that at some point have been part of the halo? So we start at the left at the Big Bang, or, or when the simulation starts at least, in the beginning, nothing is in the halo yet. So it's all dark blue, not yet accreted. As we go along, this not yet accreted fraction goes down all the way to zero, of course, by construction. That's how we set it up. What you can see then is that as time goes along, the circumgalactic medium fraction gets bigger and bigger. The interstellar medium fraction first becomes bigger, but then gets smaller again. And it peaks at around cosmic noon when the star formation rates are quite high and therefore there's also a lot of interstellar gas. The stellar mass just goes up and up. And what also goes up is how much gas has been ejected. Uh, ejected in this case means not ejected from the galaxy, but ejected from the halo. So beyond R200, beyond the real radius. And here there's also a difference in a dark and a light color. Dark color is stuff that has ever been in the, in the, in the primary subhalo. That's the detail that we don't want to go into now. But this plot emphasizes again the importance of ejection to large radii, even beyond the halo scale. Now, another nice thing that, that uh, Peter did is um, he took a method that we developed 
some years earlier with A.L. Neistein to convert a hydrodynamical simulation in a semiotic model. So a semiotic model tracks some components for each halo. And a component could be the mass in a circumgalactic medium that's shown all the way on the left, the vector, the mass in the interstellar medium, the mass that's ejected, the mass that's temporary in some wind, and the mass in stars. These are rates here on the left. So you can set up a system of differential equations where you take the rate, which is a function of the, of the vector all the way on the right, the current mass in each compartment and some interaction coefficients where uh, you have accretion from the intergalactic medium onto the halo, which we can predict using simulations and, and, and analytic theory quite well and all the other stuff that we can't predict so well. So all these interaction coefficients in a semi analytic model have a physical approximation that tries to predict them and they're then tuned. But what you can also do is you can just measure them in a hydrodynamical simulation. And each of these coefficients in this matrix in, be measured in the simulation as a function of halo mass and redshift. So that way we have a semiotic model that reproduces the simulation. And that's what we did with A.L. Einstein for the OWL simulations, Peter did it again for Eagle. But what Peter did is he went beyond that. He then started to manipulate this matrix to see if we can learn about the physics of galaxy formation. So one thing you can do, for example, is to plot again the efficiency of galaxy formation. So it's the ratio of the stellar mass to the halo mass as a function of halo mass. And then what you can do is you can change these individual co coefficients in a matrix and make them either smaller or larger. And then see what the effect would be on the galaxy at late times. And we can see then determine what actually sets this efficiency of galaxy formation. So looking first at the top left panel, there, what we did is we changed the efficiency of halo accretion, so the accretion of gas onto halos. Now that is, we don't think it's very uncertain because it's basically set by cosmological initial conditions, but we can still just see what happens. When you change that up and down, the galaxy mass goes up and down, as you would expect. What if we change the rate at which, or the efficiency not, uh, with which gas that has been accreted onto halo makes it down to the galaxy? Right? Not all the gas that has been accreted onto the halo makes it into the galaxy because some of it is intercepted by outflows and some of it is not able to radiate away its binding energy. But what if we change this by hand? So that's the second panel here from the top. And what you can see is that if you make that rate much larger, black is always the default value, the value actually predicted by the Eagle simulation. If you make it larger, it doesn't change very much. Right? So apparently it's pretty soon no longer a bottleneck and therefore the galaxy formation doesn't become faster. If you make that less efficient, of course, it's going to go down. And what about outflows? That's the third and fourth panel from the top. Um, you can change the outflow rate at the halo scale and also at the galaxy scale. And what you see, if you make the outflow rates very small, then at some point the galaxy formation efficiency doesn't go up anymore because it's no longer the bottleneck. If you make them higher and higher, it gets down smaller and smaller. The bottom left shows two recycling terms. Recycling means gas that was blown out and then comes back. So the efficiency with which it comes back, you can adjust. Halo scale recycling is stuff that left the halo and came back. Galaxy scale recycling happens within the halo. And you can see that these things don't, they matter somewhat, they're not negligible, but in the Eagle, at least they're not dominant uh, mechanisms. Most of the gas that's blown out doesn't come back. Finally, on the bottom right is the efficiency of star formation. So the time it takes gas in the interstellar medium to get into stars, which is set by the microphysics of the interstellar medium here. But in this model that is this basically a self-regulation model with feedback loops left in, built into it, in such a model, that efficiency of star formation turns out to be not so important unless it's very low. And that's because it's not a bottleneck. The gas consumption time scale in the interstellar medium is observed to be about a giga year. Um, and in starbursts, burst much less, which is smaller than other time scales of interest. So it's already not a bottleneck. If you reduce it, however, so if you make it a factor of 10 smaller, as in this blue line, it does become a bottleneck because now it's similar to the age of the universe. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, what, another thing you can do is instead of scaling these things up and down, you can change the, the, the mass dependence of the coefficients in this matrix. Another five minutes, Jim. Okay. So that was done here. This is again the galaxy formation efficiency as a function of halo mass. 
And now uh, the black line is fiducial. And what we've done here is give the coefficient the same value as it has for Hebel's of 10 to the 12 solar masses for all masses. And then you change the shape of this curve, not its normalization, but the shape. So you can see then what is set, what is setting the shape. Well, if you um, uh, change, if you look at the red curve, if you change the outflow efficiency, make that mass independent, then you really uh, change the low mass end of this, this uh, relation. So at low mass the outflows are most important, but the accretion efficiency, this blue line and the recycling also certainly contributes. At high mass, uh, outflows are, are again of, of importance, but the most important there is accretion efficiency. So how, how much gas makes it from the halo into the galaxy. Yeah, this is a, a, a subtle point that's actually important for the interpretation. So the curve I showed you before was depending on the plot, either the black or the red. The black curve here shows the fraction of the halo mass that's in the galaxy in the form of stars as a function of halo mass. And that's what people usually plot. And then you might wonder why does it decrease so much with halo mass? If we have hierarchical structure formation, then a mass, a halo mass of 10 to the 14 is actually built up of bits of 10 to the 12 and lower. So if we build them up of 10 to the 12 and lower, then all have a galaxy fraction that is up here, that's high, how can we then end up with a low galaxy fraction? Well, that's a good question because you don't really end up that way. It's just a matter of how you measure things. So people usually plot the stellar mass in the central galaxy only and only the inner part of it really. Uh, and then you get this very sharp decline. Now, if instead of measuring the stellar mass within 30 kpc as is done for the black line, we measure it all the stellar mass that's bound to this inner halo. So for a cluster of galaxies, that means that, that the galaxy can be 100 kpc, very, very low surface brightness stuff going throughout the cluster even. Then you get a much higher galaxy mass fraction at the high mass end, as you see. At low mass, it doesn't matter. Now, if you also include all the satellites, you get the green curve. And then you get indeed almost no decline of the galaxy formation efficiency. Because in clusters of galaxies, there's much more stellar mass in the satellites than in the central galaxy. So this decline in the efficiency is a bit misleading that people always talk about that galaxy formation is maximally efficient at the Milky Way scale. It really depends on how you measure. Um, and that also determines the evolution of this, this relation. So if we look at the right panel here, that's again, galaxy formation efficiency versus halo mass. And now we're showing different redshifts, predictions by the Eagle simulation. And these roughly agree with the observational, the inferred measures. You can see there's some evolution, but this evolution actually comes again by the way we measure this. So if we now don't just use the stellar mass in the center of the halo, but if we use the, uh, uh, the, sorry, if we now, in, in this case, what I'm changing is not actually the halo mass going from right to the left panel, but what I'm dividing by. So in the right panel, we divide by the halo mass. In the left panel, we don't divide by the halo mass, but by all the mass, the cumulative mass that has ever fell, fell into the halo for the first time. That is what's actually relevant for galaxy formation. But there's a difference between the total halo mass for several reasons. One is that some of the dark matter that falls in gets out on the other side again before it falls back. It's called splashback. Um, and there's various other uh, reasons why there can be differences. So if you take the measure of the halo mass that's actually relevant for galaxy formation, the stuff that the baryons trace that fuel star formation, that is done on the left side, uh, then you can see almost all the evolution is gone. So this evolution comes really again by how you measure things. Um, I'll just give one example because I'm out of time of, of the other kinds of things you can do with these kinds of simulations. And that's to, to not just look at the scaling relations but also in the scatter and the scaling relations. And here's one example of this. What we're showing here, this is work from a, a former PhD student, Jorat Matei. On the y-axis is the stellar mass of the galaxy on the x-axis is again the dark matter halo mass. Each point is a galaxy and the color coding is now by the formation time of the dark matter halo. When did the dark matter halo, at what redshift did it assemble half its current mass? And what you can see is that there is a clear correlation with the scatter. If a dark matter halo formed earlier, then it has a higher stellar mass compared to if it formed later. 
And this is to do with the, the formation time of the dark halo is about its concentration and its binding energy. So this could be an indication if the formed earlier, it has a higher binding energy and that makes feedback more inefficient and then you form more stars. That's one explanation. Another explanation is if you formed earlier, you just had more time to form more stars. In this kind of game, to investigate the scatter in these relations, um, we played with lots of different scaling relations, but I won't, won't take you through that. Um, and I will switch to some to the end of this and show you the conclusions, the main takeaway points I'd like you to uh, remember. So that is these large scale simulations, they're quite useful also for many things I didn't show you. For example, you can make virtual observations, investigate observational selection effects, etc. But keep in mind that they don't predict things from first principles, particularly when it comes to galaxy properties. There's all kinds of different uh, of these simulations. You have zooms, you have large volumes, you have AMR, SPH, different subgrid recipes. They usually agree on the things they calibrate to, which is typically the galaxy masses, but they can differ quite dramatically in other respects, which means we can learn something by comparing these, re these predictions that differ with observations. And they have become quite realistic uh, in recent years compared to what they were earlier, in a sense that they are realistic enough now that they're not obviously ruled out by the observations we have. And therefore you can use them to get physical insight into what is going on? How do galaxies form? For example, what determines the scaling relations? What determines the scatter in them? And I've given you a few examples of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joop. That was an excellent talk, giving us a good overview of the subject, but also some of the latest results. That was really cool to see. Do we have any questions from the audience? Well, whilst we're waiting for the first one to come through, um, I was wondering, because there's so many things still to explore with these simulations, whether you zoom in and do more detailed um, subgrid physics and explore that, um, or maybe widen your testing range against multi-wavelength observations, um, how do different simulation groups coordinate amongst themselves? Something maybe us observers could also learn from. Um. There's some coordination sometimes that people do comparisons. Um, a lot of the data is public. For Eagle, all this data is public, all the raw data, all the, the process data. For Illustrious TNG, that's also the case. The other ones I don't think are public. So anyone can do these comparisons themselves. You can download the data and, uh, and do any, investigate what you want. Um, but a lot of it is not coordinated. So there's competition, of course, as well. Okay and uh, people are developing independent ways and, and different people have different philosophies of how things should be done and uh, what is uh, more plausible than, than, than what. So uh, it's a very healthy state, I think, that there's, that there's a lot of different uh, things going on. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, any I questions? Question. Yep, I can, I can hear someone. Uh, speak a bit more loudly, please. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Um, is there is there a semi-analytical model for um, uh, chemical evolution that uses uh, delayed differential equations that you know of? Um, you mean that that uh, the, the 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 elements are not released instantaneously, but with some delay yes. according to set? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually something that we are using here. Uh, the semiotic models, semiotic models haven't, most of them still don't use this. Some do, I, don't ask me exactly which ones. But here we have subgrid models that are like semiotic models for what happens inside the star particle. And there what we do is we uh, uh, sample an initial mass function. And then we just compute as a function of the age of the star particle, which stars are dying and then release the elements from that the stars that are dying at that time step, according to yield tables that produced from stellar evolution models. Okay. And then we have the, the, the elements we track. We track individual elements, uh, nine individual elements. And as sources, we track massive stars, asymptotic giant branch stars, and supernovae of type 2 and type 1a. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, some of these, um, I'll say a bit more until there's another question. There, there's Some of these things are quite uncertain, right? The, the yields are very uncertain. So if you look at different stellar evolution models, they predict quite different things. So also there, the predictive power is not so large. Uh, when people make stellar evolution models to predict yields, they often have to decide how much mass falls back onto a star. And what they do then is they choose something that produces yields that look a bit like the sun. So it's a bit of a also using observations to calibrate things. And for type 1a, there's the additional thing that we don't even know what they are. And therefore the delay function is quite uncertain as well. Okay, uh, sorry, one last, uh, do, you have, do you have that kind of uh, uh, semi-analytical model like uh, free to everyone that I can look at? There, the, the paper that describes the chemical enrichment model is RIOSMA 2009. RIOSMA et al. 2009 is a former PhD student of mine. The uh, essentially, the same, essentially the same model is used by TNG. And uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. And if there was, um, I feel bad for you skipping over uh, some of your slides at the end. If, if there's another slide you'd like to uh, talk about them, feel free. Uh, we've got another couple of minutes and then I'm just worried about yeah, my Wi-Fi cutting out at 4 p.m. I can show some more, but I don't feel badly about it. You should feel badly about it. I always uh, <laughs> make sure I have more than I have time for. Um, sure. But let me, I can show if there's no question, I can show you another example of, of some of these scaling relations. So this is from uh, another paper from Jorg Matei. Um, showing now the, what we call the main sequence of galaxy formation, the relationship between star formation rate and mass. Now, in this case, we divided star formation rate by stellar mass, and then you get what's called the specific star formation rate. So you take out basically the, the main trend, which is that star formation rate is roughly proportional to stellar mass. And what is shown here is the distribution of eagle galaxies in this plane of specific star formation rate versus mass. The thing on the bottom of this line are galaxies that don't form any stars and this basically places the resolution limit. So there's no, this could be zero as well as what is shown here. And uh, what you can see is this, this typical distribution that you can also observe, but now we've color coded it by something you can't observe and that is the formation time again of the dark matter halo. And what you can see here is that if you look for galaxies that are below Milky Way masses, so galaxies that haven't been quenched yet, and you can see that if you look at the top of this diagram, it's mostly blue and the bottom it's red, which means that galaxies that are forming stars at a higher rate than is typical for their mass live in dark matter halos that formed recently. And galaxies that are forming stars at a lower rate than is typical for their mass, they live in dark matter halos that formed a long time ago. So this again, this formation time of the halo is quite important. And what could we uh, try to look for observationally to distinguish that? Well, the formation time of the halo is, is very much related to the concentration of the dark matter halo. And that has, uh, you know, it's not so easy to observe this at high redshift. At low redshift, you can do that uh, to some extent. If you have rotation curve data, for example, or satellite kinematics, you can try to reconstruct uh, or, or even for massive galaxies, the hot gas profiles, you can reconstruct the concentration and test some of these things. And at the massive end, people are trying to do these kind of things. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Bonus slide. <laughs> okay. Well, the last call for any questions. If not, then a final round of applause for you. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you, my pleasure. You can hear a few others also clapping there. All the emojis. <laughs> See the emojis. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.